So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Pipentima, the president and CEO of CBIA, the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. And welcome to today's webinar regarding what employers need to know about the COVID-19 vaccination process. We've got a great group of three panelists covering three different areas of the COVID vaccine process, the science behind the process, the rollout here in Connecticut, and employment laws around vaccinations. Um, in September, by way of background, I was fortunate to be asked to be part of the Governor Lamont's 21-person uh, vaccine advisory team. And having met thousands of businesses over the past several months and a lot of their employees, I can certainly tell you that uh, questions around COVID and the vaccination process is the number one topic on everyone's mind. In fact, the traffic to our CBI website uh, was nearly 1.5 million people in 2020 and the top sites visited were all associated with our coronavirus section on our website. The structure a little bit around the governor's vaccine advisory team, um, it consists of the top level group and also three subcommittees that we'll be talking a little bit about today. Uh, there's a scientific group who reviews the eligibility of the vaccines as they become available and has a lot of knowledge to answer questions around the vaccine makeup. And we're luck fortunate today to have one of the members of the scientific subcommittee. There's also the allocation subcommittee who reviews and recommends who should be vaccinated and when in the process. And then the communication subcommittee, which I also sit on, is responsible for factual and effective messaging around the vaccine. And just so everyone knows, the way the process works is the subcommittees develop recommendations to the top level group. The top level group either accepts or rejects uh, these recommendations and then passes it on to the governor who has the ultimate authority to accept or reject the, um, the recommendations. And as of today, uh, hopefully many of you are aware, uh, the advisory team has recommended to the governor and the governor has accepted uh, that we use the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, which we'll talk about, that we vaccinate group 1A, which uh, included healthcare workers and nursing home residents, and that we start the vaccination process of group part of group 1B as they're known, specifically 75 and up. And tomorrow we start the registration and vaccination process of 65 and older. So now that you understand a bit about the process that goes into the sausage making, I wanna introduce our three panelists who will uh, happily answer your questions today if they can. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom uh, of the screen and um, we'll jump right into answering questions after I introduce them. So David Bannock, is an infectious diseases physician and hospital epidemiologist at UConn Health and an associate professor of medicine at UConn School of Medicine. David is also the medical director for the Infection Control and Prevention Program at UConn Health. And in that role has been a clinical leader for the UConn Health COVID-19 vaccine <coughs> program. And as I mentioned, David serves as the co-chair of the scientific subcommittee of our vaccine advisory group. So welcome, David. Krista Veneziano, I believe I said that right, Krista, if I haven't, you'll correct me, is an epidemiologist with the Connecticut, Connecticut Department of Public Health within the public health preparedness and local health section. During the pandemic, Krista has played a key role in the department's coordination of the COVID vaccine rollout, and she's been with DPH for over 21 years. And last but certainly not least, Floyd Dugas is a senior partner and chair of the labor and employment practice at Milford-based Bertram Moses. And throughout his 34 year career, Floyd has represented private and public sector employers in both union and non-union settings. From the beginning of the pandemic, the labor and employment attorneys have been advising employers as to the myriad and unprecedented issues that have been that have arisen around the COVID-19 and its interaction with various laws, including FFCRA, the ADA, and numerous executive orders issued by Governor Lamont. Bertram Moses is also a CBI member, and we're pleased to have Floyd with us today. So thank you all for joining. Um, David, you know, let me start with one of the questions before we jump into the Q&A and one that we're getting a lot now that more folks are getting vaccinated. And that is if someone gets vaccinated, aren't they immune to the disease and why would they still need to wear a mask or practice social distancing? Um, so, cause that's something that's on everyone's mind as we start to move to getting employers and employees vaccinated. You mind taking that one right off the bat? Sure, I and mean, that's a really great question. Thanks again for inviting me uh, to join the webinar. Um, so, so I think that's one of the potentially one of the most important questions. So, you sort of we have what we know and what we are still learning about. What we know is that both the uh, mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, 
have demonstrated to be very effective in preventing COVID-19 illness. So um, the individuals who receive these vaccines have a very high level um, of protection against becoming sick with COVID-19. Um, that includes individuals developing any symptoms, even mild symptoms, and these vaccines are particularly effective in preventing severe illness or hospitalization. So that, that's what we know. And um, you know, I think that's really critical in um, really uh, helping uh, alleviate uh, the impact of COVID-19 on individuals and you know, the community as a whole. Uh, what we're still learning about is the impact that vaccines have on the ability to transmit infection. So um, you know, what we know is that it's a possibility that an individual um, who is vaccinated and gets exposed to COVID-19 may become infected with COVID-19, but be asymptomatic, which is good for the individual because they're not getting sick. Um, but we're, what we're still trying to learn more about is whether these individuals might still be able to uh, transmit virus to other people. Um, and the concern would be if they uh, transmit a virus to someone who is not vaccinated, that person could potentially uh, become ill. So um, while we're uh, still uh, gathering that information from both the clinical trials, as well as from our real world, use of these vaccines. Uh, the current recommendations are to continue implementing the preventive measures, the masking, uh, the distancing, um, and uh, you know, the, all the other measures that we've been um, implementing now in the past year. You know, what I will say is that there's a lot of optimism from what we're seeing in early studies uh, addressing this issue, that um, it does seem like uh, there is uh, certainly a, lo a lower uh, risk of those individuals who are asymptomatic and vaccinated transmitting um, infection, but it, it isn't zero. Um, and I think as we get more information on that, um, as people continue to get vaccinated in the community, um, and as our rates of COVID transmission in the community, or the overall sort of level of virus spread um, continue to diminish, um, we're gonna continue with the preventive measures. And I think those kind of, that kind of information, the amount of virus in the community, the, the amount of um, you know, the quote unquote herd immunity that we see is gonna help us understand um, when we might be able to de-escalate those measures, the, the universal masking, um, the, uh, dis the distancing recommendations, avoiding large gathering, um, you know, in the weeks and months ahead, um, but certainly a topic that's on everyone's mind. Um, so, you know, again, the bottom line is these vaccines have demonstrated um, effect effectiveness in reducing people from becoming ill with COVID-19, the re vaccine recipients, um, and we're still learning more about the impact on transmission um, as a whole. Uh, but it's really critical and, and we'll learn more and more about this, uh, you know, in the days, weeks and months ahead. David, one of the points I think you raised applies to all of us, all four of us on this. And uh, we were talking about it earlier, and that's just the, the fluidity of this whole situation. You know, um, things are changing. That's why we got so much attendance for this webinar. And we'll talk more about that. But I know in the in the team briefings we've had, it's patience has been the uh, the word of choice and, and being patient with this as, as you, the scientific committee, learn more about the vaccine and the impact it can have. Um, Krista, let's roll to you. There's some questions already about the process. So before we jump to the specific questions, let's just talk about the registration process itself because obviously a lot of employers haven't gone through it while well, healthcare workers have and 75 and up have and 65 and up is about to. The registration process as we know it and have communicated is, um, is an employer goes to VAMS, is one of the methods, uh, just complete some basic information, including who their vaccine coordinator is, and then they wait. And I think that's what some employers are in the process of now waiting. Can you talk about the rest of the process, assuming it continues down this pathway for employers? Sure, sorry about that. We just got a dog last week and she doesn't really bark. So all of a sudden today she decided she's gonna bark. So. Apologies for that. My husband just came down. Hopefully he takes her and puts her somewhere so we all don't have to hear my new dog barking. So I'm going to back up and let you know what we did. And a lot of you probably already know, um, and then get into where it's going. So early on in the process, there was a survey that was done for everybody. Um, and you filled out your information and uh, you sent it in and it is in our database somewhere. What they're hoping to do is to upload that information directly into VAMS and then send people the um, follow-up emails that would then trigger or allow you all to then upload your rosters. So that is what we started with and kind of where it's going. If not everybody had filled out their um, a survey, then um, we have an employment uh, survey 
or registration. They, they keep going back and forth with the different terminology, the registration, enrollment. So what that website is, is saying I am part of whichever sector you, you select from the drop down and saying, you know, I'm in part of this sector, please allow me um, to get vaccinated, my employees get vaccinated. That's your employer coordinator role. And then when it's the manufacturing, this is manufacturing, right? When it's the manufacturing sector's turn to be vaccinated, then everybody will be uploaded into the VAM system. And then the emails will start rolling saying, log on, give us more information, uh, upload your rosters. There's a few different steps for it, but um, that is what uh, the process is. Does that make sense? It, it, it does, Krista. So kind of let's dive right into some of the questions. So I'm an employer, I filled out the phase one, if you will, I hate to use phases and groups because we're using them for so many other things, but part one of them, but I filled out that first screen mm -hmm. and I haven't heard anything. So now that is the next process that they will be reached out to by DPH or you know the, the program itself and asked to upload their employee roster. That's essentially the next step. Yes, to the, to the best of my understanding, yes. So you just wait until it's your turn, you'll be uploaded and then you should receive something directly from DPH um, asking you either for more information or to upload your roster. And let's talk about rough timing, Krista. I, mean, I know we don't have a definitive date for when essential frontline workers will be ready for that part two of the VAMS. Um, we did announce that registration to 65 and up will start tomorrow. There's about 350,000 people in that group. We're getting about 60,000 vaccine, first dose vaccines a week. So the rough math says maybe that's a four to five week process that would put us at the first half of March or maybe the middle of March. Does that sound about right timing for the essential businesses that where registration would start, not vaccination necessarily? Um, I believe that's hopefully the plan. Um, we are reviewing phase 1B um, with essential workforce and seeing how to actually roll that out. So we're not sure because if you just, if you take out the 65 and up and you have all the other sectors listed, it comes out to over a million individuals. And we're trying to figure out the best way to roll that out so people are not frustrated so if we say, okay, all 1 million people go ahead and make appointments, the first, you know, few thousand will get their appointments and everybody else will go, wait a minute, I don't have my appointment. What's going on? This is awful. This is terrible. And we want to keep that frustration level down. So we're trying to figure out the best possible way to roll it out. So there isn't a lot of frustration and, you know, people know better when they might be vaccinated instead of like, oh, you're gonna be in six months um, because you can't find an appointment. So we're trying to work on that as well. So I don't have a great date for you, but that's kind of the process we're going with. Right, rough timing. Thanks, Krista. Um, just a reminder everyone, use the Q and A uh, feature if you can instead of the chat and we'll make sure we get your questions answered. One more Krista before I go over to Floyd, because um, it just goes right in line with what we're talking about. And, a lot of folks want to know, will there be a further tiering of Group 1B? In other words, when essential frontline workers are eligible, is there the potential that maybe we put teachers in the front and manufacturers in the middle or you know, some hypothetical like that? I'm not saying that's the exact case. Do we expect further tiering of Group 1B beyond what we've seen already? It, it's a possibility. We haven't, there's no decisions been made. The governor obviously is the one that's going to make any announcement to say, this is how we're going to do it. We're trying to talk through all the different um, scenarios, which I'm sure we're not going to catch every scenario, but we're going to try really hard and, um, you know, try and figure this out so it rolls out smoothly. Um, so it, there could be um, different phases within the phase of the uh, frontline essential employees. Right. And again, the process we remind you all is uh, that's why we recommend that you listen to the subcommittee meetings as they happen on CPN. The allocation subcommittee, if I'm right, Krista, is currently kind of wrestling with that. Do we further tier Group 1B and would make that recommendation to the top level group and DPH and then on to the governor if that's decided? 
Right. So yeah, there is a there is a, a small committee that's that's talk, talking about it. We're trying to look at numbers within the different sectors that the subcommittee um, put forward to see how it could work out. Like, you know, who would go where? Like, would would teachers go to their local health departments and manufacturing go to mass vaccination clinics? And who would go to the different hospitals? It's 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 a lot of information to try and figure out. So we're, we're trying, we're trying very hard and please be patient with us. <laughs> a lot of logistics. Um, and there's one question in, in the box about uh, that second phase, once the employee roster is uploaded, folks will get an email about getting vaccinated. That will go directly to the employee. My understanding is Krista, and that's why when you load your roster, every employee has to have an email address. It doesn't have to be a company email address, but everyone needs to have an email address. Correct. And they all have to have a unique individual email addresses. Um, so if say there's a husband and wife working together, um, you can't have the same email. You would have to have like one for her and one for him um, because that is how you register within the VAM system. So you could, um, so they can track who you are. Because if you have the same email, you won't be able to make two first dose appointments. Okay. We're getting more activity here than viewership at the Super Bowl uh, during that blowout. So we'll work through these questions. Floyd, you're up. And I, I know somewhere in here is one question and then I'll segue to another one I saw because they're related, but the one every employer wants to know, can I mandate the vaccines for my employees? And then part two of that, which is being asked is, can I require suppliers and or customers who are coming on site? In this case, there's a specific question about artists coming to a campus. Can I require that they show proof of vaccination? Sure. So uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so the, the short answer, uh, the way I'd like to break um, my response to that question down is union versus non-union setting. Um, the EEOC has issued guidance um, that uh, addresses what I'll call the non-union, well, all settings exclusive of a union setting um, and there were specific concerns around the Americans with Disabilities Act in particular, and being able to require um, folks to get vaccinated and asking questions, um, and also um, other, other federal legislation, including uh, GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And importantly, the EEOC looked at the guidance coming out of the CDC and and really in some ways kind of bent if not threw out some of the rules and in its guidance said essentially, yes, you can um, require uh, employees to, uh, to get vaccinated. Also, you can require them uh, to tell you uh, if they have been vaccinated, even if you don't require it and require them to tell you uh, if they've been tested and the results um, and that those things won't violate for example, the, the ADA. So they've really um, smoothed the way, if you will, for employers uh, to attempt to, um, uh, if they want to uh, mandate the vaccinations. Um, the union setting is, of course, a little bit more complicated. Uh, in the union setting, uh, we have to deal with the National Labor Relations Act and the obligation to bargain over terms and conditions of employment. Uh, in addition to wages and hours. Uh, and <clears throat> we talked about this being a very fluid situation. We couldn't exactly go to the, to the uh, playbook um, to use your Super Bowl analogy uh, and look up uh, COVID and pandemics. I mean, there just really is not a lot of case law uh, in history, although there's a little bit. Um, so for example, um, you know, the H1 uh, situation that occurred, I think it was the early 90s, um, a number of uh, hospitals in particular had required vaccination. Um, and we have at least one case coming out, I believe it was from Virginia in a hospital system. And in that case, the National Labor Relations Board had ruled that uh, mandating employees in a union setting is in fact a mandatory subject to bargaining, which means you have to bargain first uh, before, before you do it. Um, of course, uh, one thing um, we have to keep in mind is that the NLRB, more so than a lot of other government agencies or as much as any, is, is a, tends to sway back and forth with the political winds. 
So in some ways, we'll have to see what, what uh, happens with the Biden administration and the ability to uh, pass the equivalent of executive orders and so forth. But uh, folks should understand that in the, um, certainly in the union context, you have to be aware of that uh, and be cautious as to how you proceed. But otherwise, uh, the EEOC has cleared the way for uh, mandating it. And I think I lost your second question, question Chris. Uh, uh, it was around suppliers and customers. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. I, I think that's a no-brainer, frankly. Um, you can certainly do that. Yeah, and there's been some, you know, okay, rumbling about industries down the road potentially requiring that. Like if you fly an airline, they may say, show me your vaccination card down the road at some point in time. Not yet, though, Floyd. We haven't heard of any industry requiring that at this point in time or uh, employers mandating at this point in time. Correct. David, turning back to you, um, another question commonly asked, and it's up in our board is, you know, I've been infected with COVID, I'm immune, uh, do, do I still need to get vaccinated, one? And two, if I have had COVID recently, do I need to wait some period of time before I get vaccinated? So um, these are really good questions. Uh, in terms of how to handle um, folks who have been infected with COVID, so what we suspect is that a natural infection with COVID um, probably confers some degree of immunity. Um, it's likely um, in the uh, early period after an infection. Um, and there's some estimates that um, in the first, say about 90 days or so, um, there's evidence of immunity. I think the key is that the vaccine um, helps boost the level of the immunity. So the level of those antibodies and T cells, and it likely makes that immune, immunity more durable. So last for a longer period of time. Um, compared to uh, what's, what happens with, uh, with natural or what we call native infection. Um, so the recommendations are that um, folks who have had a COVID infection um, should still be receiving the vaccine unless they have some other contraindication to receiving it. Um, and what the CDC um, recommends in terms of the timing um, is that uh, the only requirement is that the vaccine um, shouldn't be given during that period of isolation. So typically it's about 10 days um, for most individuals um, need to be in isolation um, after uh, from the onset of their uh, infection. So they need to wait out that period before they get their dose of vaccine. Um, and one uh, suggestion is that in the time of a vaccine shortage or a limited supply of vaccines, um, you can wait uh, up to 90 days uh, before getting that first dose of vaccine uh, because of that kind of short-term um, immunity associated with, uh, with uh, having a natural COVID infection. Um, so the window period, at least 10 days after um, the onset of infection um, and uh, up to 90 days um, from that time uh, is when it's kind of the window where we look to vaccinate folks who have been infected. Um, and it is, like I said earlier, it is still recommended um, that those individuals, um, if they, uh, unless they have a contraindication and once their time comes um, for eligibility that they do get vaccinated. Krista, a bunch of questions on the process itself. Let me see if I could kind of lump a couple together so we can knock them out of the way. Again, everyone, if you could use the Q&A feature, uh, we're working our way through it. Uh, I know there's some in the chat and I'll try to get over there if I get through the Q&A. So Krista, on the process itself, a couple of people are asking, what's the format for uploading the roster is in Excel? Uh, and uh, what if an employee doesn't have an email? Let's get those couple out of the way. Okay. So I did, I saw that chat or in the chat or the um, question and answer. So the format is a CSV file. So I believe you make it in Excel, your roster in Excel and you save it as a CSV file. There is an employer coordinator user manual. And if you look at page 11, it will tell you more about the roster uploads. Um, I put that in the Q and A. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to put it in the chat um, but I can do that as well. That would be great. Okay. Don't worry. I'll be going to one of the other guys and you'll have plenty of time to drop stuff. All right. Well, I just did it because I would forget. Great. Thank you. Um, now, if somebody doesn't have an employer um, email or a, a business email, you can use their um, personal email if they want to give it to you. Uh, that would be fine. And are you asking if they don't have an email at all? That's one of the questions, yeah, and I know it's a common one we've been asked, and we've told people, go to Google and go to wherever and create an email account. Yeah, I mean, that's that's acceptable, too. You know, we, we would want you to because that's how they make appointments and send you reminders and um, that type of situation, you know, that's, that's what they use. Um, if you really just can't use a computer and you just 
can't do it. There isn't a, what is it, a vaccine assistance line. There's another A in there, administration assistance line that you can call and um, they can help you make an appointment and I will find that phone number and put it in. But they're really hoping that people take it upon themselves to actually use the computer and um, schedule your appointments. Yeah, I believe the number is 877-918-2224. You can drop that in, Krista. Um, now, again, that is the number that some of the elderly are using right now, Krista, because they maybe don't have technology or access, but the desire for uh, the group is that employers coordinate uh, through the email. And, and there's a question about who will that email come from, making sure it doesn't get caught in spam or things like that. It will go directly to the employee, but who will it come from, Chris? That will it come from DPH or some other automation? There will be a, a couple of emails that an employee will receive. They'll receive one from DPH. It's called our Everbridge system. Uh, that's just like a mass email system that we use. Um, and it, it'll give you some information about, okay, this is what's coming next. And um, part of that email will tell you, be on the lookout for an email from CDC. Um, it's a CDC no reply email. Um, it, that's the one that you need to click on the link and then complete your enrollment in VAMS. So they'll, once you click on that link, you're going to put in just a bunch of information, your, your name, well, it'll have your name, but your address, your telephone number, um, different allergies that you might have. Um, it, you can put in your um, insurance information, um, just some basic, you know, information. And then you will get to the point after a few screens of clicking and next and save and whatnot, you'll be able to look for a, uh, an appointment. And if you don't find one, you put in your um, zip code. If you don't find one right away, like in your town, you can expand your search. Like you don't have to stay in your town. Like they have mass vaccination clinics at Rentschler Field. So if you put in the zip code 06118, Pratt and Whitney Airstrip, I believe that's what it's called. You're, you're more likely to find a, a clinic there or an appointment there than if you're waiting for a small, um, you know, your clinic down the road that only has, you know, a hundred doses a week or something like that. And again, that, that email will be going to the employee. Don't, the employer, you don't have to know all this information about each of your employees. So two more along those lines, Krista. Um, one is um, the mass vaccination tool or an employer who's larger in size. Can they do something to have the vaccination on site rather than trying to push all their employees out? Why don't you answer that one second? Because I know this first one applies to a wide variety of folks on this. And that is... Um, that is what I forgot. Oh, that is when you do the roster, is it every employee that works for you? Are, are we trying to vaccinate every employee and the essential frontline workers or just those who are currently coming in? And if someone can safely work from home, they don't stay, they're not on that roster. Right. So phase 1B and 1C are, are the distinction between the two, or at least that's how the definition has been right now. So phase, I, I have it on my computer here. So phase 1B is frontline essential workers. Those are the individuals who work in select sectors and are at risk from work-related exposure to COVID-19 because their work-related duties must be performed on site less than six feet um, from the public or co-workers. So somebody like me, who of course is so essential, <laughs> I can work from home uh, you know, I have my family here driving me crazy, uh, but I don't have to go out. So I am not an essential, a frontline essential worker, uh, and I may not even be an essential worker in 1C, which is fine because I'm home and I'm not really going out. So if your individuals are coming to work and they have to work close to one another, then they could fall under this definition. If you have I don't know, I, I don't wanna insult anybody, but say you have an accountant who works from home and can do everything over the computer, um, he or she would not be a frontline essential worker. Yeah, the way we describe it, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, is we're trying to get vaccinated those folks that are currently exposed, right? They're out in public or they're coming into work. If you, we're not trying to get vaccinated those folks who aren't currently at risk right now. If they're working from home and they're working safely, we're not trying to add them because we're only getting 60,000 first doses a week We've got millions of people to get through in the state of Connecticut. Is that generally accurate? Correct. Yes. Yep. And you asked about um, on site clinics. So I did put in the chat, I answered a question. Now I have to find it. There are 
you can, if you have a large enough corporation or business, um, you can ask uh, or inquire with vaccinators if they'd be willing to come into your facility or business and perform a vaccination clinic. Um, and I put in the chat here, I'll have to find it, um, a link to the employer portion of our website that lists out um, a few vaccinators that you can click on and get their information and, and um, reach out to them directly. So Great. I will put that in the chat once I find it in the answered question. No problem. I'm going to go on the employee next, so I'll give you some time to do that. And again, everyone, if you use the Q&A feature, that will be great. We're dropping other things in the chat. Uh, we've got about 20 questions to go through. We're halfway through here, but we'll try our best to get through all of them. Floyd, you got a couple here for you. Um, one is, let me just start with this one. Should an employer require a negative COVID test if someone who has uh, gotten COVID and is quarantining, let's say they've reached the 10 or 14 day mark, whatever mark you want to use, should, should employers still be requiring a negative test? And then I'll move on to a slightly different topic. Yeah, and, and I might actually defer to David for part of this answer because <clears throat> I ran into it. Uh, in fact, we had somebody in our own, one of our offices, um, a paralegal in one of our offices and she tested positive. And we said, um, not knowing much in the beginning, this was pretty early on, you have to stay home until you can produce a negative test. Well, almost a month later, she was still testing positive, even though she had no symptoms, felt perfectly fine. And, um, and the CDC, of course, had some guidance on this. And I believe the latest was if you have, um, if it's been 14 days from um, you know, the onset of symptoms, then you can allow the employee uh, back into the workplace. So uh, why don't I defer to David to uh, add to that? But that's, so the short answer is no, be great to get one, uh, but you could be waiting a long time. All right, so, um, so thanks Floyd. Um, you answered that uh, at the level of an epidemic, infectious disease epidemiologist. So uh, I've been so watching a lot of Fauci. <laughs> So, so uh, what Floyd's describing is something, and, and this evolved quite a bit over uh, the last year. So, um, you, you know, the, it's important to understand uh, a little bit about the tests. Um, so uh, when someone becomes infected with uh, the virus, um, you know, the virus is live in their body, it replicates, it can be contagious to others. Um, but the PCR test um, only detects genetic fragments of the virus. Um, so the issue is that um, we know we know from now from studies, multiple studies, that um, for most individuals, um, the duration in which they harbor live virus um, that can be transmitted is about 10 days um, from the onset of symptoms. So that's the duration that they're considered to be um, infectious. Um, the problem is that in the weeks afterwards, maybe even months afterwards, in some cases, um, they still have um, viral fragments or viral um, RNA. Um, in their in their nose, um, it, they're not infectious um, per se, but um, it's probably dead virus that you know lingers around. And because those PCR tests are so sensitive at picking up viral fragments, um, they do detect um, those viral fragments in the weeks and months, even after someone is no longer considered contagious. So for most individuals, um, we use that 10-day period. In some situations, um, like uh, very immunocompromised individuals, they may shed beyond that period, and so those are kind of handled on a case-by-case -case basis. But for the majority of the public, it's uh, based on that time criteria and symptom criteria rather than requiring a negative test um, afterwards because uh, of what we've learned about those tests and how they distinguish between live and infectious virus versus um, non-infectious virus uh, fragments. That makes sense. Employed um, on the uh, vaccination itself, there's a question, and we've gotten similar questions about this, so you can answer it the way you want, but. Uh, requiring new hires to be proof of vaccination. This question is a little bit different, which is interesting. It's, can I require a new hires proof of vaccination down the road, but not mandate my current employees be you know, vaccinated? Um, take that one the way you want. Yeah, um, it's certainly you can, you can certainly require new hires to produce uh, a, a negative test, for example, within 72 hours before coming and reporting to you. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't see any problem with drawing a distinction between existing employees and new hires. So if you only wanted to do that for new hires uh, from an employment discrimination standpoint, I, I don't see a problem with doing that. Okay, and, and one of the questions I just answered yes to, but tell me if I'm wrong and we'll, we'll let them know, but it was, can you require uh, someone to, to provide a test? In other words, if you got a sub supplier coming on site, a customer coming on site, 
just like the kids going to universities are required to produce evidence that they've had a COVID test and a negative one. Yeah, no, no question. Of course, you know, the validity of that and how long before uh, the test occurred and, you know, how effective that is, is a whole nother conversation, but um, you, you certainly, uh, you certainly can do that. One more Floyd, then I want to go over to David for a couple here, um, but this one's been asked a lot and that is um, around mandating the vac vaccine, vaccination, but an employee refusing and a couple of things there. One, is the employee allowed to collect unemployment uh, or eligible? Uh, obviously they're always allowed to file, but will they, you know, are they eligible? Two, if, um, if I do mandate it and the employees are applying, do they, are they eligible to collect PTO, pay time off? Um, three, if an employee gets vaccinated uh, and they come on site and refuse to wear their mask because now they think they're immune, which David just told us they're not, uh, am I allowed to discipline that employee? So when, I know they're slightly related, slightly different, but. Yeah, the, um, so I think I got all those pieces, but let me, let me start with the uh, refusal. Um, you know, certainly if you're mandating, uh, there has to be a consequence. And, and some people have suggested one approach is the carrot versus the uh, stick, um, you know, reward them in some way. Um, is that really mandating? Uh, probably not, um, but you, you also can penalize them, uh, even possibly consider termination. Uh, again, putting the unionized setting aside for a moment. Um, and, and what I would say about that is, you know, mandating without some serious penalty or, or carrot um, is really not mandating at all. So, you know, that's something to consider seriously. You, you obviously need to consider your particular workplace and how important it is. I mean, you know, obviously if you're a healthcare institution, that's one thing. Um, if you are a manufacturing facility and close, you know, you think of the chicken processing facilities uh, where there was a lot of spread in Iowa, um, you may want to mandate it there. On the other hand, if you have an environment um, uh, where a lot of your folks are working remotely and at home, uh, particularly if you're dealing with professionals, um, you know, maybe you don't uh, uh, mandate it, but um, you certainly have the ability if you require it. Uh, to, to do it, union setting, obviously, that's something you'd have to bargain because that's an impact um, issue. In terms of unemployment, um, I haven't actually analyzed that in terms of the regulations, but I'd be shocked if uh, under those circumstances, somebody um, wasn't allowed to collect. Um, I suppose you can argue it's willful misconduct, uh, but um, just knowing our system, I would think uh, they would uh, generously provide them with the um, the benefits. Um, in terms of whether they'd be eligible for paid time off if, if they declined, um, you know, again, you'd have to look at your specific policy. I'm not a big one on allowing, for example, sick leave for people who aren't sick, but if you have a general PTO policy and, um, you know, you could allow them access, but, you know, how long is that going to last? That's going to run out at some point. So I'm not sure that that's an the answer. And by the way, what I what I should say and add is there, there are two huge exceptions to mandating, one of which is if somebody has a medical situation that prohibits them from getting uh, the virus, and the other would be, or a disability in particular, and the other would be some sort of religious objection. And um, the EEOC says in both of those cases, you have to consider those factors, and if it's a, a bona fide um, situation, you're going to have to consider some sort of an accommodation, whether it's working remotely, leave of absence, and something of, um, uh, of that nature. I think, I think there was a fourth one. I'm trying to remember. Um, no, I, I think you got the three of them. There is, uh, you, you mentioned something, and there's also a question about this, and that is incentivizing employees to get the vaccine, paying them, uh, not mandating it, but paying them. And you seem to say that's, if I heard you correctly, that's okay. Absolutely. Yep. And then relative to that, um, do you recommend, well, I uh, recommend is difficult for a lawyer, so uh, I'm, I happen to be one, um, but how about, um, what's the way to ask this that you would answer in a lawyerly way, but um, do you recommend paying people while they're getting the vaccine? So I have to take a day off to get vaccinated. I take some hours off to get vaccinated. Yeah, so I mean, certainly if you want to get compliance, right? Um, and so I, I would I would be inclined to say, yes, it's it's an extraordinary, unusual situation. And uh, if that's what it takes to get people to get there and get it done, I, I certainly would support that myself. 
And, and let's talk about, David, that compliance. We want employers to be part of the solution. I know employers want to be part of the solution, David, and that's the whole getting to herd immunity. I have a couple of questions here, and that is, can we even get to herd immunity without uh, vaccinating children? As you know, the, or you tell us, David, the two vaccines uh, don't go below 16 or 8, 17, I believe. Um, so talk just briefly about that, David, and then we've got some other technical questions for you on the vaccine itself. Sure. Um, I can talk about that uh, briefly. It's a tough question about this herd immunity concept. I think, um, you know, we've, we've seen different estimates um, of what it takes to get to herd immunity. And, you know, there's a lot of moving factors as well, depending on uh, sort of which proportion or which groups of the population become immune. You know, the data does suggest that um, children are less likely to spread the virus. So um, if we focus our herd immunity on adults, uh, maybe uh, that may get us further than if we look at the population as a whole. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, again, em, I think employers, um, you know, do have um, an opportunity to uh, help contribute to that by um, encouraging their employees to get vaccinated. And also, I think it's a benefit to the employer um, to keep a healthy workforce um, and, uh, you know, help um, help protect uh, the employees uh, and their organization. So, um, you know, we'll get there. It's, I, I wish I could give a clear cut answer um, on what we need to get to herd immunity, but um, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, we'll, we'll need time and, uh, you know, there'll be other factors that will uh, intervene uh, as well. So David, a couple other ones for you that are related. So one is up here that says, can I get COVID from getting the vaccine? Uh, kind of a, this is a frequently asked question relative to the kind of the myth sheet that we have that we're, we'll share with everyone. And the other one is I've heard of people testing positive after they've gotten the vaccine. How should an employer deal with that? Sure. So um, good questions. As far as the first question, um, the answer to that is no. Um, in our current vaccines that are available, the mRNA vaccines, um, they don't contain any live virus. Um, they, um, you, you get uh, basically a little bit of the genetic code as part of the vaccine. It stimulates that immune response, but there's nothing live about it. The virus, virus can't replicate. It can't infect your cells and cause you to be sick. So you can't get uh, the COVID infection from the virus, from the vaccines. Um, and the other question, remind me again that second question. Uh, the other one is that, that we've heard of people uh, testing positive after getting the vaccine. Right. Is that possible? How do employers deal with that? So why don't you talk about how long someone could still be uh, exposed? Sure. So, so a good question. You know, I think um, you know, there's a couple of different scenarios that can unfold. So someone after getting their first vaccine um, can subsequently test positive the days after, the weeks after, and, um, and, and they may actually become sick with COVID. Um, you know, until you get both doses of the vaccine and even a couple of weeks thereafter, you really don't reach that level of, um, of protection to prevent uh, someone from becoming illness. So they may have been incubating even before they got their vaccine um, and uh, didn't show uh, symptoms of illness until after the vaccine, just kind of bad timing essentially uh, with, uh, with when, regard to when they got infection. And then that other question you know, comes into play um, you know, after someone is fully vaccinated and immune, can they still test positive, even though they're asymptomatic? It kind of goes back to what I mentioned originally. Um, you know, it's a possibility. Um, we, we don't know uh, the, the risk of that at this point in time. Uh, there's plenty of studies going on to really uh, quantify that. Um, yeah, but uh, what we do know is that the vaccines will prevent uh, illness, um, people from becoming sick with uh, COVID-19 um, at a very high rate. And, it, and I will also give the caveat that um, you know, the efficacy rate was not 100%. It was upwards of the 95% uh, uh, range in uh, the uh, mRNA vaccine trials. Uh, so um, not 100% guarantee that someone can't develop clinical COVID. Although fortunately, even those who develop clinical illness after being vaccinated um, tend to have milder symptoms that don't require, you know, hospitalization. Um, and that, and that's, that's important as well. Um, so it's still possible, um, but seems to be much less of uh, a severity um, if that does occur. So David, let's hit you with two more before going back to Floyd and then back to Chris. Uh, for Chris, we've got a whole bunch of them in here. Um, but two that have come up, because uh, you just mentioned it is the you know the uh, vaccine, the the, um, the shot itself doesn't penetrate the cells, and of course the urban myth of 10 to 20 years down the road we're all going to have multiple limbs, and um, you know is this is this a risk one? And then the other one that's come up is uh, J and J Johnson Johnson vaccine which you and the sub, uh, scientific subcommittee will be uh, dealing with as far as whether to recommend that the state of Connecticut support the use of J&J. Why, one of the questions is why would I, if I had the choice, why would I go with J&J at a 70 something percent effectivity versus the other two out there, uh, which in the 95%. So um, I'll speak to uh, that. Uh, so the first question um, was uh, regarding, um, does it affect our, D, our own DNA and that sort of question. So the mRNA, um, 
uh, vaccines. So the, the mRNA actually goes um, into the cell, but it doesn't go into the nucleus, which is where all that DNA is housed. So it doesn't interfere with any of uh, the recipient's uh, DNA. Um, it basically lingers in the outside part of the cell called the cytoplasm, where it um, kind of helps use the body's um, protein making to make that what we call an antigen that generates the immune response and provides protection. So it doesn't actually go into the DNA um, or even the part of the cell where um, the DNA is present. And um, one, one, and these, these uh, mRNA vaccines, once they go into the cell, um, do their job, they rapidly get broken down. So they don't like linger in cells for um, any uh, you know, prolonged period of time. Um, so, so I, I think it's an important question, but um, at this point, uh, based on their mechanism, how they work, they, they wouldn't interfere with the, uh, the host uh, DNA. And then regarding the, the J&J vaccine, so um, uses a little bit of a slightly different mechanism of action compared to the mRNA vaccine, same principle. Um, but basically these um, vaccines contain a non-replicating virus um, in them. So, a vi so basically you link on some of the genetic material to a vector, which is, a, which is an inactive virus um, that brings the, um, the uh, genetic material into the outside of the cell, not the nucleus, um, where the host uh, DNA is, um, and then allows you to make that uh, protein to uh, generate that immune response. So, um, and, and that virus that's in those, uh, in the J&J &J vaccine, the adenovirus is not replicating. It can't cause you to be sick. Um, it just basically is a delivering mechanism for the um, for the the genetic material to make that immune response. And then in terms of efficacy, so um, you know we're still getting more and more data. The the sort of official FDA um, review is going to be in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and on our subcommittee um, for the state vaccine advisor group, we're reviewing it at that point as well. So we haven't seen the full data yet um, that's going to be presented to FDA. Um, in terms of efficacy, you know the efficacy rates that we're seeing are still quite high, um, so upwards in the 70% range. Um, I think some of the, the pluses of this vaccine is it seems to be a single um, dose vaccine, which is really important. Um, and uh, you know, to be able to generate that type of immune response uh, with a single dose is going to be really critical to, to getting um, that sort of herd level immunity quickly. Um, and uh, additionally, it has less uh, stringent storage requirements as the, uh, M to the, as the mRNA vaccines and can be ramped up a little bit quicker. So I think it's going to be really important um, to get this vaccine out into the community. Um, I think once the data is presented, we'll learn a little bit as to whether or not it may be more favorable in certain groups, like certain age-specific groups, um, and maybe um, we may see differences um, in age groups, but we don't, we don't have that data just yet. Uh, but I do think it's going to be a really important asset to uh, our um, vaccine armamentarium, and uh, you know, I, I expect we'll be using it uh, quite frequently here in, in uh, Connecticut. And David, just real quickly, are, are the vaccines working against the variants that we're seeing? So important question. Tough to answer that really quickly, um, but because uh, we're still learning about this, you know, I think the key, the 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 major variant that we're concerned about is this UK variant. Um, and from what we're seeing, um, both uh, in the real world as well as um, in laboratory studies, it seems to be effective in generating antibodies um, against this particular variant. You know, we have to keep an eye on these other variants that are popping out um, throughout the world. Um, they, they seem to have um, a few other mutations that aren't seen in this UK variant. But, um, you know, at this point, uh, you know, we're still learning more about that and uh, the overall uh, impact that uh, these variants are going to have um, in terms of virus spread and vaccine protection here in the U.S. Great. Thanks, David. Floyd, uh, two for you that are related. Um, it, it basically has to do with I get the vaccine and now I have some symptoms and David could certainly talk about these, you know, flu-like symptoms, the headaches that you hear sometimes hear about as a side effect. One is that if I'm an employer and I mandate it, is the employee now, is that a workers' comp potential claim, uh, assuming they're out long enough, you usually comp is a three-day, I believe, uh, limit. Uh, and two, um, and if it's not comp, uh, do we pay them under um, some type of uh, you know, paid leave? Yeah, so let me <clears throat> answer the second question first. And, and I think that's a pretty obvious yes, uh, because if they're having symptoms and they're ill, regardless of what the cause is, they're sick, they're ill, and I would uh, uh, let them use it. You can make a judgment call as to whether you charge it against their sick leave or not. But certainly, um, I would... Um, treat it as any other illness. And of course, you may, it may or may not be related to the, to the vaccine, right? Um, and then uh, second of all, in terms of, um, you know, the workers' comp piece, um, you know, again, as you point, from what I've seen, the symptom, those who have had reactions, my daughter's a nurse, she, she had it pretty good for about 24 hours. The sister's a nurse had it for about 24 hours. I, it shouldn't go past the three-day requirement. So I can't imagine 
it's going to be much of a workers' comp um, issue. Um, thankfully, I haven't heard anything about any long-term consequences. In theory, that could trigger workers' compensation, but um, I certainly haven't seen any, anything uh, amounting to uh, that type of long-term um, problem. Same, so David. I'll, I'll chime in as well. Um, you know, we've vaccinated many healthcare workers here at several thousand um, here at UConn Health, and um, you know, most, al almost all of them um, who have developed any uh, symptoms afterwards, um, and it, it's predominantly um, sort of weakness, some achiness, uh, some uh, usually low-grade fever. Um, you know, typically 24 hours, occasionally 48 hours, but it would be pretty uh, unusual to see anything extend beyond that three-day period. Um, and you know, it's important to remember these aren't. Uh, adverse um, effects, they're sort of secondary effects. It's a sign that the vaccine is doing its job. It's generating, um, you know, those antibodies, those T cells. Um, it doesn't mean that there's an actual like infection occurring uh, from the vaccine. Although, as we mentioned earlier, people can still get um, COVID infection even after that first dose um, early on. So, um, so uh, you know, I, th I think these, these symptoms are a sign that the vaccine is doing a good thing. I um, mean, you know, I got my vaccine and I got pretty minimal symptoms. I was almost disappointed. Um, and I, uh, you know, I was like, "Ooh, I hope I didn't get a placebo or something." But, uh, but um, so, and it's it's across the board. Some people get really robust um, response and vac and symptoms. Some people don't um, get symptoms but still get a good vaccine response. Most people um, uh, fall into that boat. So, uh, and again, not for more than um, I would say two days. Um, even on average, it was probably more like one day. And Floyd, one more before we do rapid fire with Krista here. Um, the, I know she's answering some as it goes, but um, you talked about the communication that you can have with employees and you know, suppliers and customers around having been vaccinated that you have COVID. How about uh, agency volunteers? A lot of you know, folks have volunteers in their organization um, from outside agencies that come in and give a hand. Uh, you mean, in, in ter is the question in terms of being able to require them to produce take their temperature, produce evidence of a, um, of a negative test uh, within a reasonable period of time. Absolutely. You know, any, any outside invitee, uh, you have the ability to restrict uh, their access. Um, and so, you know, much more so than even your own employees. So that's certainly something that you could require. Okay, Chris, uh, rapid fire here. Let's get uh, see if we get through these in, uh, in seven minutes. Um, you may have answered some of them. If you have, let me know. Otherwise, uh, but some of these, uh, they go to everyone. So I got, I got folks who live outside of the state of Connecticut, um, but work in my site. Uh, do, are they included on my roster? Uh, if, if she unmuted, you would have, she would have said yes. Um, <laughs> It, it is for those who are registering, uh, does it go down to a certain employee size or is it all size of, of employers, including just an employer with one employee? Yes, all, all sizes. I, I would concur with you. Um, relative to the on-site vaccination potential, and again, you've got to work with your healthcare provider, your occupational health, call David maybe, um, but if you're going to do it on-site, is there a kind of a size threshold? I don't know. You'd have to talk to the vaccine um, ad, uh, provider and say, you know, I have this many people. Could you come out and do a, a vaccine clinic? I'm sure they all have different um, requirements. Right, exactly. It's for the healthcare specific, right? And again, what we're trying to do is with those big employers, kind of get them out of the VAMS pipeline, if you will, or, or clog the system a little bit. Uh, right. So work with your occupational health person, call your local hospital. Uh, and see if they could do uh, something there, including a CVS, Walgreens, Walmart may even be able to do. Right. And help. I put in the chat here the link to the website for employer. No. One of the links I put in here will take you to the um, website for employers where it has um, a list of different vaccinators that you can click on and get some information for them. I have a business that falls under multiple categories, child care workers, frontline workers, social services. Do I just choose group 1B? You know, some are in group 1B, let's say, some are in group 1C. Um, do I get to just register all of them under group 1B or do I have to kind of split my roster up? No, you'd end up splitting up your roster, right? Uh, okay, we'll skip over that one. Um, let's see here at the beginning. Um, it, it, who is included in essential workers, Krista? We kind of jumped over this. We could drop a link in there, uh, but if you want to just kind of rattle off some frontline essential workers that are right now potentially included in Group 1B, still to be defined though, let's be very clear about that. Right, so uh, what did the allocation subcommittee say? 
um, first responders, food service and restaurants, agricultural workers, including farm workers, US Postal Service workers, manufacturer workers, grocery store and pharmacy workers, public transit, food bank and meal delivery services for the elderly, education and childcare workers, solid waste and wastewater workers, inspectors working on site in the above locations, and frontline public and social services. That is what the um, allocation subcommittee submitted to the governor, the governor approved. Now we're trying to define underneath each because what if I say I'm a, a, a first responder? So we're, we're trying to figure out how to do it, you know, appropriately. Yeah, for the <laughs> definition. And let's be clear for folks on here because there is a question about automotive technicians and I think some other questions there too. Back in the spring, the definition of essential worker in Connecticut was keeping businesses open. And I believe that was the definition that kept about 90 to 95% of our industries open. What we're now calling frontline essential workers is different than the spring definition of essential workers. And it's the category that Krista just rattled off. You could go to our website, you could go to DPH website on the FAQs and it lists those groups in both group 1B and uh, what CDC has talked about in group 1C but again, group 1C has not been defined. So that's why your automotive technician may not be in group 1B, although they were allowed to stay open. Uh, if we did, everyone who was allowed to stay open back in the spring, Krista, we'd be vaccinating a couple million people at the same time, which right. you're only getting 60,000 doses a week, right? Right, correct, yes. Um, let's see here. Uh, the other question was, do I register my subcontractor? I, know, I got someone who comes on site a cleaning company, um, and they may not even be in group 1B. I've got a subcontractor who works on site, uh, maybe even in a different, do I register them in my roster group? No, they, they, their employer should register them. And if they're their own employer, then they would have to register themselves. You, it's only people that you pay um, on your you know, employer roster. Is it true that if I do have a vaccination site of my work, it would also be open to the public, not just my employees. Uh, no, I don't believe so. I believe you can work with your um, vaccine provider and it would be, I believe they call it a closed clinic, third party clinic. So no, I don't believe so unless you wanted to open it up to <laughs> the surrounding area. That's right. Okay. That's my understanding too. And I know folks are hearing about the yard goats event and the rental field event, but those are open public events, the 75 plus 65 plus those one employer is putting an event on and Krista one more. And I think I've got one for Floyd, if we could sneak it in here. And that's, uh, I've got a large list of employees in my, that I got to develop on my roster, but I haven't been requested to upload it yet. Do I just sit here and wait, or should I start getting that larger list together of names, emails, you know, while I'm waiting for the registration to open up? Oh, I think it would be, you know, the sooner you can have it ready, the sooner, you know, when you're asked to upload it, you can upload it. So just keep in mind the definition of what I just mentioned, and I'll put it again in the chat about um, the individual's risk factors and needing to be at work and not just putting absolutely everybody onto your roster. And I'm going to put the definition here for you. And Floyd, uh, there's a question here about if I have to shut down my facility as a result of an outbreak, um, do the employees, are they eligible to collect unemployment for the days I'm shut down or, uh, and also do I have to provide paid sick leave? Um, so the, um, you, you would be able to collect unemployment um, depending on the, on the duration. Um, <clears throat> in terms of whether you'd have to pay them sick leave, um, you'd have to look at your particular policy. Again, I go back to, I'm a believer in if you're sick, um, then um, you're eligible to access the sick leave and that now an employer may create an exception to that and, and allow it. And of course, uh, FFCRA expired. So we're no longer subject to, uh, to those requirements. Um, although some folks may have seen last week, the governor extended it to uh, teachers. Um, and, and who knows if there might not be another executive order extending that to others in Connecticut. But um, anyway, that's the short answer. Thanks, Floyd. Well, we're right up against it. I appreciate you all. That was a lot of questions. We answered 68 questions in a one hour period. Um, you know, Krista, David, Floyd, thanks for your time. 
Thanks for everyone dialing in. If you have questions that went unanswered, we will try to get them to you. We will also, there's a, this uh, has been recorded, so we'll get it out to you. Uh, also check out the CBIA.com website. You go to our resources tab and there's a coronavirus category. Everything that we're getting from the uh, vaccine advisory group, we're putting up there real time. Uh, there's a lot of great FAQs in there. There's a lot of great myth busters about the vaccine that David talked about. Uh, certainly sign up for our, our daily and weekly newsletters. And if you are a CBIA member, you have free access to our HR and safety teams uh, at 860-244-1900. Thank you all three of you for your time today. Greatly appreciate it. I think we got a lot of questions out to the public. So uh, have a good week. Sure.